Good morning. This morning I'll be reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 46. If you want to follow along in your pew, this can be found on page 643. Isaiah, chapter 46, verses 8 through 13. Remember this and be brave. Take it to heart, you transgressors. Remember what happened long ago, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and no one is like me. I declare the end from the beginning, and from long ago what is not yet done, saying, My plan will take place, and I will do all my will. I call a bird of prey from the east, a man for my purpose from a far country. Yes, I have spoken, so I will also bring it about. I have planned it, I will also do it. Listen to me, you hard-hearted, far removed from justice. I am bringing my justice near. It is not far away, and my salvation will not delay. I will put salvation in Zion, my splendor in Israel. This is the word of the Lord. We're about to uh, tap into some um, discussion about who God is, and we're just going to confess from the beginning that even though we want to read and absorb everything that Scripture reveals to us about God, even what we absorb, uh, there's going to be mystery to that. One of the things that we're noticing about the mystery of God is that we don't understand fully what it means to be sovereign, so we need help. To understand that, these are just three resources. There's a whole, you go into my library, almost every resource I have um, points in some way to the sovereignty of God. Uh, but these are three that I think are very practical and helpful. I'll go from um, girth to smallest. Um, Randy Alcorn, easy read. If you know anything about Randy Alcorn, he's one of my favorite authors. If God is good, faith in the midst of suffering and evil. One of the questions we ask a lot if if God is sovereign, if God's over everything, how come there's so much suffering in the world? Um, uh, similarly, there's a, a resource here called Suffering and the Sovereignty of God by John Piper, Justin Taylor. This was a whole conference that they did on the subject, and they compiled the, the messages into one book. And then an, an absolute classic uh, book is a book by A.W. Pink called The Sovereignty of God. A.W. A. Pink was a pastor who lived many decades ago, and not a big book. But I promise you, you could read Randy Alcorn's book a lot quicker than you read this one, not because the language is hard at all, but just because every sentence in that book just seems to, wow, I need to reread that, I need to reread that, I need to reread that, and uh, that book has ministered a lot to me um, when I'm trying to grasp what it means that we have a sovereign God. Um, Let's pray. Just feel led, we need to go to him again and just ask for his help. Lord. There is no way <laughs> in 25 to 35 minutes talk, expound all that you're saying in this one text, not even this text, but all the texts that point to your rule and your authority and your supremacy. I pray that we would be able today to zoom out from our lives and to truly behold a God and learn something today about you that changes us. That resets our compass in our life. Would you please do this and have mercy on us as we go here in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you have ever played King of the Mountain? Yeah. How many of you have also played it recently? Um, I'm a risky now. Chad has. Okay. <laughs> don't doubt that. Um, King of the Mountain. If you don't know what this game is, a lot of us raise our hands, so you probably do know what this game is. Uh, King of the Mountain is this game where uh, somebody is placed on the top of the hill or the mound or whatever we refer to as the mountain, and everybody in the neighborhood, all the friends, all the ones participating and playing, they are trying to dethrone the one on top of the peak of the hill. So there are a couple battles going on here. There's the battle internally, 
as you're striving to get up the hill, depending on the surface of the mound, if it's a grassy knoll, that's not so bad, right? Grass, you can kind of dig in and kind of climb up or, or whatever. And, but if it's gravel, it's loose gravel, so you're kind of slipping down the gravel trying to get up that hill. If it's sand, you're kind of sinking into the sand. And you're probably thinking like, Jason, where have you played this game? Yeah, I played it on all three places. It was fun when we played it. It was always a challenge individually. How am I going to climb up strategically? How am I going to surprise the one at the top? How can I take over and, and be sneaky about that? But there's also the battle with the other people, right? That's really where the fun, the more people you had, the more fun the game was because you're not just trying to take on the person up at the top. You're trying, you're competing with the ones around and you're pushing them down and tripping them. And, and yes, your pastor's saying he played this game. And this was a game that we played as children, and it was fun. And, and I'm going to say that the closest that I've ever been to sovereignty is the time that I ruled on top in that game. I felt like I did something. I was reigning. It feels good even if it was for a brief moment. There's nothing like battling and aspiring to defeat others and, and to feel that you've done something. You've ascended to the peak of the dirt pile or the rock pile, and finally you accomplish something. You feel supreme, and then the back door opens and mom yells, Hey, it's time for dinner. Come get off the mountain and get away from the dirt and come wash your hands and get ready for dinner. All of a sudden, that supremacy that you feel is like, oh, now I've got to do what mom says. Fleeting. Such a quick moment. The feeling of absolute sovereignty really does elude us. We really don't know what it means. Whether it's a game, whether it's at work, whether it's in life, Today we look into this series of knowing God and, and we're going to look at the sovereignty of God. We're going to unpack today what it means that God is sovereign. And then next week we're going to, just like we did with holy, 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 we spent a whole week of what it means that God is holy. And then we came back the next week and we learned how that gives us hope. That's the same thing today. We're, we're only going to spend two weeks on the topic. God is sovereign. And then we come back next week to learn the joy and the blessings of what it means to trust in a sovereign God. But as a word, here's the way the dictionary defines sovereign. Supreme ruler, having ultimate power. Supreme ruler having ultimate power. In regards to God, and based on this basic definition, it's simple, but it's clear, and even though we might fight it, there truly can be only one true sovereign. If sovereign means supreme ruler, not one of several rulers, not one ruler taking its turn, not one kid on top of the mountain getting overtaken by others. No, if it means supreme ruler, and if it also means having ultimate power, that means once you rule and if you have ultimate power, there is no one that can overcome you. When we speak of sovereignty, we speak of supremacy, kingship, ultimate rule and authority, or as A.W. Pink said in his book, in the second chapter of that book, to say that God is sovereign is to declare that God is God. To say that God is sovereign is to declare that He is the Most High, doing according to His will, that He is Almighty, the possessor of all power in heaven and on earth, so that none can defeat his counsels, thwart his purposes, or resist his will, end quote. That's just a glimpse of what's in that book. It is to declare, when we declare God is sovereign, it is to declare, like the psalmist says in Psalm 115, 3, our God is in the heaven, is in heaven, and does whatever he pleases. He is king. Of the mountain. He is king of every mountain, and there is no one who has the right to demand that God come in and wash his hands and get ready for dinner. 
So today we're going to unpack this. Today we're going to look at that he, what, what we mean by sovereign, we mean that he is God, that he rules, that he is free, and he does what he wants. Let's take them one at a time. First of all, his sovereignty means that he is God and we are not. He is God and we are not. Listen to the way the prophet Isaiah is quoting and saying this from God. He says, remember this, be brave, take it to heart. This is verse 8, you transgressors. Remember what happened long ago, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and no one is like me. For I am God, there is no other. I am God and no one's like me. He is unmatched. He has no equal. There is no one to share glory with. There's no one to share authority with. No one to rule with. There's not a committee of gods coming together and okay, uh, Zeus, you can reign here and you can reign here, God. And you can, no, there's one God who rules all things. He is the only king of every mountain. There is no one close to aspiring to his position. And just in case we miss the supremacy announcement or the announcement of his supremacy in verse 9, he does a little contrast here in verse 8 and verse 12. Did you catch it? Remember in verse 9 he says, remember what happened long ago? I am God, there is no other. But in verse 8 he says, remember this and be brave, take it to heart, you transgressors. Then verse 9, I am God, you transgressors, I am God. And then in verse 12, it says this, Listen to me, you hard-hearted, far removed from justice. The word transgressor here literally means rebel, rebellers or people who rebel, revolters, people who are in rebellion. So what are they rebelling from? When people rebel or revolt, what are they rebelling or revolting from? The one who is an authority, right? So even in the context here, he's saying there are some of you who are revolting against the one who is in charge. You transgressors. You rebels. From rule, from all authority, from law. You rebels are people who are seeking power. But I'm the one with the power. You hard-hearted literally means you obstinate ones. You hard-hearted against the one or the one who is trying to reach you. He is saying, I am the sovereign one. You are the revolters. I am in control. You are not in control. I am God. You are not. 1 Chronicles 29 Verse 11, 12, and there's so many scriptures. We don't have time to get into all of them today or next week or this year. (laughs) It's just on every page in scripture, these announcements of God's sovereign rule. But this is one that I think is good for us to read and think about. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the splendor and the majesty. I mean, just kept going. Greatness. Power, glory, splendor, and the majesty for everything in heaven, in the heavens and on earth belongs to you. Pause just for a second. The one with all the power, all the glory, all the splendor, all the majesty is the one who has everything in his hands. Not some of it. Not a portion of it. He didn't create the world, step back and say, okay, I'm not in charge anymore. I'll be waiting for you to see if you get it right. I'll be waiting at the end of your race. No. We'll look at that in a minute. Everything in the heavens and on earth belongs to you. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all riches. Listen to this, all of us who are striving for um, to get out of debt, striving to uh, come into health, striving to reach for things that we uh, are striving for. Riches and honor come from 
you. And you are the ruler of everything. Riches and honor come from the one who's the king of the mountain. Power and might are in your hand, and it is in your hand to make great and to give strength to all. It's in God's hands to give us strength. It's in God's hands to honor us in his timing. It's in God's hands to provide the resources that we have. It's in God's hands to give it and dispense it when he wants to do it. That cannot be said about any of us ever. Only Yahweh, the one true God, to know the sovereignty of God is to recognize his reign, his rule, to recognize his ability and to recognize our inability our inability to do and to be and to um, climb up to what he already is i'm reminded of the great aspirations of rudy rudiger in the movie rudy if you haven't seen it great great movie came out in the 90s every college male in the world male and female probably saw that movie and said i'm quitting everything i'm doing and i'm going to go try out for the best football program in the country because it was so inspiring uh maybe not every at least i had that conversation with my dad but um rudy was an aspiring young athlete wanted to walk on at notre dame play football there and he was about the size of this podium if you haven't seen the movie, and he had done everything he could do. He had gone through all the semesters at a junior college, and he was now coming to the, it's like his last hope. He comes in, and he's meeting with the priest, and he says, well, pre, the priest says, what can I help you with, Rudy? And Rudy says, I've done everything I know how to do. This is my last chance to apply. This is my last chance to get into Notre Dame. This is, this is my last chance, and I was just coming to you to see if there's anything you can do. And so you hear the passion, and you can see the priest, and the priest responds this way. He says, in all my studies as a priest, I come to, I've come to hold two undeniable truths. One, that there is a God. And two, I'm not him. What encouragement to Rudy, right? Like, I'm coming to you. Can you pull the trigger? Can you do something? He's like, Rudy, there is one who's in charge. This is our reality. All of our strivings. At the end of the day, we are saying, Lord, you are God, and I am not. He is God, and we are not. The second thing that his sovereignty means for us is that he rules all things. We don't like to say the word rule a lot in our day we don't like to say that we are governed by a ruler or by rules but god rules all things that's what it means to be sovereign we see in verse 10 that he is over he rules over all of time after he says, for I am God and there is no other, I am God and no one is like me. Verse 10, I declare the end from the beginning and from long ago what is not yet done. I declare it, the sovereign one says. I declare it. Create your five-year plans, your strategic goals. It's good to have those goals. It's good to list them out and say, okay, by December this needs to happen. By May this needs to happen. That's okay. That's all good. But the sovereign one says, I have declared all things from end to, from the beginning to the end. Scripture declares all through the omnipresence and the omniscience of a God who is called the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. We read and studied in Colossians earlier this year. He is not surprised by anything. He rules over all of time. I'm reminded about this being somewhat comforting to a, a, a youth, a student, that I was doing a camp. I was speaking at a camp a long time ago, and this girl came forward, and she was talking to me. She said, Jason, it just seems like everything's falling apart. My boyfriend just dumped me. My parents split up last year. Uh, all my friends are turning on me. They're siding with my boyfriend instead of coming beside me. And for a teenager, that's your world. 
I mean, forget about the future. Forget about when you're 25 and thinking about when you're 30, where you're going to college. It, when your boyfriend dumps you and your friends turn on you and then your parents split up, your world's falling apart. And, and she said, I just feel like I'm sitting on the curb watching this horrible parade of my life. And I don't know what to do. And I just got to look at her and tell her, oh, what happens when you look at a parade? You see one thing at a time. Oh, here comes the band. Okay, there's the band. Okay, good. What, what's next? And the band goes by. Here comes the Snoopy float. I, I've never been to one of those parades, but those happen. And you get to look at that. Okay, that, they do a really good job on that. And you get to move on. And you see one slide at a time. And I got to tell her joyfully, reading some scriptures with her, God has orchestrated the parade of our lives. And all we get to see is sitting on the curb is one thing at a time. And yeah, we would like to, like, what's coming is, is that who's coming? Like, we want to do that. But God says, I control all of time. I'm the master of ceremonies of the parade of your life. That's what it means to be sovereign. sovereign. He rules all things. That means nothing is too big or small for him. Look with me in verse 9. Remember, what happened long ago. He's pointing them back. I'm God, there's no one like me. Verse 11, he says, I call a bird of prey from the east. I like that. A man for my purpose from a far country. In Matthew 10, Jesus says this, that there's nothing too small for God. He says this, aren't two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father's consent. Think about that. Aren't two birds sold for one penny? And when a half a cent bird from somewhere on the planet falls to the ground, it does not happen without God's sovereign approval. A half a cent bird. This is Jesus saying this. Yet not one of them falls to the ground without your Father's consent. And then... You think that's something. Even the hairs of your head have all been counted. As sovereign as he is, he is intimately involved and there is nothing too small for the sovereign rule of God. He's ruling over the number of hairs of your head, even the number of hairs that on your head that you will have next week that you won't have next week that you have this week. God's counted them. He knows them. This is astounding. This should astound. We don't understand this kind of wisdom. We don't understand this sort of oversight. I just have two kids, and I'm always wanting to know, what happened today? Just between two, what happened today? I'm fine. I'm good. Everything's all right. That's not how it always goes. They share with us. But as parents, we do that all the time, right? Like, what happened? We don't even know what's happening with our one, two, eight kids that we have in our family, and God knows everything and oversees it all. Nothing too small. And there's nothing too small that might think that it's big for God. In Proverbs 21, we see God's direct hand even over those who think that they are big. Proverbs 21 verse 1 says this, A king's heart is like channeled water in the Lord's hand. He directs it wherever he chooses. Talk about sovereignty. Passages like this should affect the way that we pray for the nations. That with every little child in China that's struggling, with every kid that's been trafficked, that the world doesn't know about, there is a governor over those laws. And we should pray to a sovereign God who directs his heart like streams of water. Oh God, act. Please work. Please have mercy. Please change the heart of that king to act in such a way to protect the little one. A king's heart is like channeled water. We see all through Scripture that God raised up people that we feel like, why God did you raise them up? Why did you raise up Babylon? Why did you say that Assyria is coming? Why did you allow Rome to grow and to do all that Rome did? Why, God, why? 
He is sovereign. And we are not. There's nothing too small for a sovereign God. And there's nothing that is small that thinks it's big for a sovereign God. And there's nothing too far from him. Look with me in verse 11. A, a, from our main text. A call, I call a bird a prey from the east. Saying, there's, there's a bird you've not even seen yet. I can reach it. A man for my purpose from a far country. Yes, I have spoken, so I will also bring it about. I have planned it. I will also do it. Perhaps you feel that your goals, some of the things you're striving for, some of that, that promotion, that job, what you want for your family, what you want, it seems so far away from you. And God's saying, it's not far from me. I'm sovereign. I'm over all things. I'm ruling all things. And just when you think you're uncomfortable enough with that, not only is there nothing too big or too small that he rules over, not only is there nothing too far for him to rule over, there's also nothing too evil or corrupt for him to rule over. So Jason, where do you get that? Turn with me to the beginning of Job. This is hard for us to grasp, and I do not have the time today to fully unpack the story and the message of Job, but what I want you to get a glimpse and to see is the beginning of a story that really wrecks our worldview. But I want you with me to submit to what we read and just learn something about God's rule. What you might not know about Job in the first five verses of Job, it talks about how Job's integrity, his family, that he was an astounding guy, that he was a, a good dad, that he worked hard for his children. He did what you were supposed to be. Dad, if there, were, if there was a role model for our lives, it would be Job. And then we see verse 6. One day the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord asked Satan, where have you come from? From roaming the earth, Satan answered him, and walking around on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? No one else on earth is like him, a man of perfect integrity who fears God and turns away from evil. Yay, Job, what a hero. Verse 9 says, Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? Haven't you placed a hedge around him, his household, and everything he owns? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. Pause. Satan acknowledges that it was a sovereign God that provided all this for Job. We need to understand that. The enemy of the one on the mountain says you're the one that has given all this to job haven't you done this for him it's not he's already he's like already taken shot to job he didn't do it you did it goes on but stretch out your hand this is satan continuing but stretch, stretch out your hand and strike everything he owns and he will surely curse you to your face look at verse 12 with me very well the Lord told Satan, everything he owns is in your power. However, do not lay a hand on Job himself. So Satan left the Lord's presence. This is shocking to us. Why would God do this? That's to be answered at another time as we would unpack Job, maybe when we do a verse-by-verse -verse study through Job. But today, I want to point out to this, that there is a reality that God rules even over the evil that you think is only Satan's work. Do not glorify Satan. He submits to a sovereign God. He roams around this earth like a lion seeking who he can devour, but he's on a leash. And sometimes I'm 
it feels like that leash is really long. Oh God, why are you giving Satan so much freedom? Cinch the leash. Pull it in. You're sovereign. That's what we see here. He's allowing Satan to act. And we see it again in chapter 2. Does the same thing. And Satan taunts the same way. And says, you've done this. you provided him. But it's skin for skin. Lord, a man will give up everything he owns in verse 4. Everything he owns in exchange for his life. Stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones. And he will surely curse you to his face. And the Lord says in verse 6, very well. The Lord told Satan, he is in your power. Only spare his life. A sovereign God reigns over everything. Things like this is hard for us to comprehend. That's why we need good authors who will submit to Scripture above all things. Help us understand why there is suffering and why God's allowing this for the season of the parade of our life. If he's sovereign, just act just do something and that's the message of isaiah where god is telling isaiah i am sovereign and for now there is evil but there's coming days of splendor because that's what i have planned nothing he he rules over everything and this also means his sovereignty means that nothing rules over him. Nothing rules over the Lord. Look with me in verse 10. He said, my original text, my plan will take place. I will do all my will the end of verse 11 yes i have spoken so i will also bring it about i have planned it i will also do it to be sovereign means you can do what you want to do there's nothing going to stop you or get in the way god is the freest of all beings and it's not even close He is not ruled by our actions or our inactions. Your perfect prayers or your imperfect prayers don't rule God. Your perfect living or imperfect living doesn't rule his decisions or actions. You are not God. He is. You can feel like that mom trying to call God in for dinner. and Like, oh, okay, God, I want you to kind of get in this box right here. I want you to kind of do this for me. It's my time. And God says, no. I will do what I want to do when I want to do it, and there's no one that can rule over me or stop me. He is never a co-pilot. He never needs permission from us to take control of any will ever, no matter how cool the songs might be. He is not ruled by our actions or inactions. He is not ruled by our theories or our wishes or our plans or even our ideas about him. Writers can write all they want. Professors can say all they want. They can try to conjure up a God that sounds good to them. Oprah can discount this and people can say this about God, but none of it affects the sovereignty of God. He still remains king of the mountain that's what it means to be sovereign our depravity doesn't even rule over him our badness doesn't rule over him how many times have we seen preachers and and leaders in the church rise and fall rise and fall rise and fall guess what god remains the same no matter how corrupt people are how People try to manipulate and climb up that mountain. He remains sovereign. But so many times we aim and we try to manipulate God. We try to coerce him. And God, we try to think that we can like pretend that we have control over God. It reminds me of uh, this part in the scene. How I don't know if you've seen the movie Batman or The Dark Knight, but there's this part where the accountant of Bruce Wayne discovers that Bruce Wayne is... Batman, 
and he's the one that like manages all the Bruce Wayne Enterprises, his funds and his accounts. So he approaches Lucius Fox, who's uh, sort of the partner with Bruce Wayne and, and the Batman plans and all that. And he says, I know, here's what all I know, and here's what. I want $10 million every year for the rest of my life. And what he's saying is there, I want $10 million from y'all to keep quiet and not to share the secret. To which Lucius Fox leans in and he says, let me get this straight. You think that your client, Bruce Wayne, one of the wealthiest, the most powerful men in the world, is also secretly a vigilante spending his nights beating criminals to a pulp with his bare hands and your plan is to blackmail this person? <laughs> and then there's an awkward pause to which Lucius Fox says to him, good luck. And that's nothing compared to what we try to do when we think we're manipulating God. God, look at my works. Look at my stuff. Look how much I'm memorizing. Look at my attendance. Look how I'm there and they're not there. I mean, this is the prodigal son story all over again. This is the older son saying, I've, I've earned your favor. And the sovereign God says, your depravity, your obedience, that doesn't control or rule me ever. But we do this in our attempt to climb the hill or the mountain we cannot manipulate, fool, trick God in any way. He is sovereign. He is the most free of all beings, which means he will accomplish his will whenever he wants to. Look with me back in our main text, and then we'll wrap it up. So I declare, verse 10, the end from the beginning, from long ago to what is not yet done, saying my plan will take place. I will do all of my will. Then there's that text about the bird and the man. I've spoken, so I will also bring it about. I planned it. I will also do it. Verse 13. I am bringing my justice near. You may not understand Job. You may not understand what's happening in front of your parade of your life right now, but... I am bringing justice near. It's not far away, and my salvation will not delay. I will put salvation in Zion, my splendor in Israel. He will accomplish all of his plans. He's sharing his plans. He's the most free being of all time. I'll get to what those plans are in just a second, but imagine with me. Have you ever had one of those days where everything just clicked? Like if you're a basketball player, you went 10 for 10. If you're a baseball player, you went 5 for 5. If you're a mom or a dad, like everything in the house just clicked. All the, everybody did their homework quickly. The food was the best meal of all time. And, and everything got cleaned up quick. And everything, everything just like that sweet spot, the perfect day. Have anybody ever had a perfect day? The feeling of like, man, I, I ran my five miles. I did everything I was supposed to do. And you're like, five miles, you lost me there. Anyway, have you ever had one of those days or weeks where everything you wanted to do, you did? Well, imagine if God is holy, 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 meaning, this was a few weeks ago, he's good, good, good. He's holy, holy, holy. Everything he does is good, righteous, just, everything holy, and no one can change him. He's never changing. This was last week. Imagine that being that's holy, 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 good, 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 never changing. Imagine him being able to have the sovereignty and the might to say everything I want to do and everything I am, I'm going to do. Imagine every moment of every day for God being like, wow, I'm the freest, the most joyful person being of all times. What's your image of God? Is it Mr. Grumpy Pants with a lightning bolt doing this? 
I would propose to you, if God is sovereign and He's holy and He's never changing, He's the happiest, most pleased being of all. And He's bringing His pleasure to us. In verse 13, this promise is the promise of a Savior. It's the promise of the one. He says, you think I'm sovereign. You, you, you think you're sovereign. You think you're in control. I am sovereign. No one can stop me. I recognize the bird. I recognize the man. I've got plans. I'm bringing splendor back to Israel. I'm bringing a Savior. I'm bringing justice. This is our God the most holy, unchanging, sovereign God who rules all, who's ruled by nothing. Nothing is too small, nothing's too big, nothing's too far from his hands, nothing's too dirty or depraved that he cannot reach and help and clean and fix and bring splendor into. And he does all that he pleases. He is holy, 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 never changing, never changing. He is sovereign. And what pleases a sovereign God is to bring his son to pay for all of your strivings to climb that mountain. It hurts to roll down the mountain, especially if the, if the mountain is rocky shell. To get knocked off and to be beaten down again and again and again. And God says, don't do it that way. I'll come to you. My son will come to you and I will pick you up and I will bring you to me. Who can stop me? This this is the love of a sovereign God who owes the people at the bottom of the mountain nothing. In fact, has every right to say, but instead he says, go. I so loved the world. I want to bring them in my sovereignty to my care. This is the splendor of a sovereign God. I want to close by reading a long text in Psalm chapter 50. This will lead us to sing, I really believe. In Psalm chapter 50, you can turn there with me if you would. We're going to read 15 verses. And then we'll sing. A Psalm of Asaph. The Mighty One, God, the Lord, speaks. He summons the earth. From the rising of the sun to its setting, from Zion, the perfect perfection of beauty, God appears in radiance. Our God is coming. He will not be silent. Devouring fire precedes him, and a storm rages around him. On high he summons heaven and earth in order to judge his people. Gather my faithful ones to me, those who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, for God is the judge. Selah. Verse 7, listen, my people, and I will speak. I will testify against you, Israel. I am God. Your God, do not, I do not rebuke you for your sacrifices or for your burnt offerings, which are continually before me. I will not take a bull from your household or male goats from your pens, for every animal of the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains and the creatures of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and everything in it is mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Sacrifice a thank offering to God and pay your vows to the Most High. Verse 15. Call on me. Call on me. In a day of trouble. 
I will rescue you. And you will honor me. The God who is holy, 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 who never changes, says, I want to help you. Quit striving to climb the mountain. I want to help you. I want to encourage you. And you will honor and glorify me. In our main text, we read, Rob read it, verse 8. Remember this. Be brave. Take it to heart. You revolters trying to climb the mountain. Quit trying to climb the mountain. There's a day of splendor coming. For those of you who know Christ, that day of splendor is coming to your life. This is why we sing. This is why we hope that there's a sovereign God. Though we're ailing, though we're sick, though we see this part of our parade and we don't like it, there's a God who owns it all. Have courage. If you don't know that Christ, if you don't know the splendor of God, if you don't know the one that he sent down the mountain to come lift you up, don't leave here today without asking one of us. I want that help from God. I need that help from God. Oh Lord, you're too good that we don't even really understand what good means. You're, you're so strong that we, we can't even fathom what your strength really means. We're, you're so wise and you rule over all things. God, what we can say and what we can confess today is that we are glad that nothing rules you, that you are ruled by nothing, that you rule over everything. And so, God, if there's some that are here in this place that are allowing evil, addictions, sickness to rule over them, I pray that they would call out to you for help right now. That they would cry to a sovereign God, help me take these things away. And for us, Lord, who know the splendor and the majesty of the gift of Christ, may we never get tired of singing and beholding a great and mighty God.